All right, fantastic. All right, so good morning. My name is Patrick Bowers. I'm at Hasselblad Institute. And uh, I'm going to talk about imagined reality gaming. So three years ago at West, we introduced a concept called imaginary interfaces. These are spatial interfaces um, that have no screen. So even though people see not, don't, do not see what they're actually producing, um, they have spatial memory of what they have produced and they can refer back to this and interact with this contents. And today my talk is going to be about how can we create imaginary interfaces for multiple users. Now it turns out that the answer to this question comes out in the form of a video game. 14, 16, out, throw it, 4 yellow, 9, score, 4. <laughs> so I think you caught the difference. This is essentially basketball, but there was no ball. So let me give you a preview of what happens under the hood. So let me just rewind this video here. 15, 14, 16, out, throw it, 4 yellow, 9. Score, four, zero, or yellow. All right, this is not though what people see. This is our debug view. We use this to find out what's going on. What you saw before is the actual game. So there's absolutely no display of the entire system. So let me go back a step and motivate this from a gaming perspective. So there are two types of games we really like. On the one hand, we like sports. The reason is they're very immersive. There's physical exertion. They have lots of wonderful properties. There's immediate social interaction. So unlike video games, we actually interact directly with each other, we look at each other, and that's one of the reasons why we do it, we also like our kids to do it, um, because they're learning wonderful things playing sports. Now what kids do instead is they play video games, which are also awesome. Um, and one of the things that make video games attractive is the fact that we can do things we can do in reality. Right? We have, have non-physical behavior, it's very, very exciting. And as a result, we have a lot of variety. While there are hundreds of sports, we have hundreds of thousands of video games. Now, the downside of when we say playing video games together today, it means though we're not playing with each other. We're together in the same room looking at the same screen. So in order to address this uh, in augmented reality, there's been a, a genre of so-called augmented reality games. And the idea is to combine both the physical reality, which you see here, with uh, augmented objects in the front. These are wonderful games. But at the same time, they're reducing the immediateness of the interaction with other social beings a little bit. So because I'm wearing you know, screens, head-mounted gear, and so on, there's lag, and I'm just perceiving things much less immediate as, as I would in a physical sport. So our objective is to kind of reintroduce um, both of these concepts, bring them together. We want the immediate interaction from physical sports and the non-physical stuff that comes out of video games. And our approach is going to be, if your background is augmented reality, we're going to do augmented reality, but we're going to just drop all screens. All right, so the outcome, which we call imagined reality <coughs> games, is games that mimic the respective real-world sports, such as basketball, we also implement a simple version of soccer, except that there's no visible ball. When necessary, we're going to use auditory feedback. You heard this, you hear like, oh, which player has the ball? But we do very little of that. We only do it to disambiguate. What we do most of the time is that people learn about what's going on by watching others. So while you can't see the ball, the moment I'm doing this, you kind of get the sense that the ball which I had before must be traveling in this direction. And because we mimic the physical reality so closely, that actually gives you 95% of the information you need and gives us the ability to have a very fast-paced game. So to illustrate the concept, if you, if you look at the scene of the striker trying to kick a, a penalty kick here, you can ask yourself, is this ball going to go in or not? And so, well, if I look at this ball, I would say like the striker seems to be aiming towards the right, right? And the goalie seems to have his weight shifted to already go in the opposite corner. So I think there's a good chance of the, of the, goal going, uh, the, the, the ball going in. And interestingly, you can have a lot of this reasoning without even seeing the ball. So in imagined reality games, this looks a bit like that. Then. <coughs> and again, I'm using the debug view for you to see what's happening under the hood here. But a lot of what's going on is actually you appreciate just from seeing how people gesture in the game. So this is what we call immediate interaction. It's very similar to physical sports. Let me give you a slight uh, flavor of the non-physical stuff. So in the middle of the playfield, we have this power-up location. And uh, let me just show a very simple one called uh, get ball. So, 70. Yellow's in ball position. None. 70. Show get up. ball. 60. Get the ball. Score. Get the ball. Two. Zero. Or black. There's a whole range of power-ups we can do. We can have low gravity and all these types of things. Uh, more in the paper. 
So let me show you how this is all implemented. So here's the, the system. As you would expect, the bottom layer of the system is a tracking system. We went through a whole range of different tracking systems. This is the one we're using right now, and it's designed to be really readily available. So if you're interested in building one of those, it's very simple. You get an elbow markers, and you attach them to hats. Um, we have an overhead camera. We wanted to demonstrate this here. Unfortunately, it takes eight meters of throw to make sure the camera sees everything, and the demo room wasn't quite high enough. But we're going to try to show it as high as possible. And, uh, the gest recognition is not quite uh, uh, visible to the camera because it's too fast, so we're using activity sensors. These are wireless uh, accelerometers on the back of people's hands, and we use that to capture the throwing and catching. <laughs> the really interesting part of the system is one level above, which is a physics engine. It's custom written, and it's very fast, and we call it the quantum engine because it does a lot of things in parallel. So, as you saw in the beginning of this talk, the actual ball is not represented as a ball. It's represented as a lot of particles, in particular 500 for this particular implementation. Just to answer the obvious questions, why don't we have a single ball? Well, playing with a single ball that's invisible does not make for a good game because it's very hard to catch that ball. So by using 500 particles, we increase the chance of this working out. Um, well, maybe you think like there's something else we could do. Maybe you can use a single ball, we're just going to snap to the player. So in video games, it's very common in help uh, inexperienced players to enlarge targets or help them to snap to different targets. Now, it turns out the amount of enlargement we would need for this would be so large that the person closer to the thrower of the ball would essentially <coughs> obfuscate and include everyone behind him or her. So that didn't work out. The particle model works extremely well, though. So we shoot 500 particles out. Each of them represents one possible plausible looking trajectory of the ball. And then we just count intersections with the different, different players. So maybe out of my 500 particles, 150 will be intercepted by, by player 16 who's trying to catch the ball. <coughs> maybe 40 reach the player who was intended to uh, receive the pass, and 200 go out. So at this point, I could just run the engine and say, well, you know, with 30% probability, this will be the intercept. You know, with 8% um, probability, it will be a successful pass. Except I don't like this 300 there, because that means we're not going to have a good game, because most of the time, the ball is just going to go out. So we need to do something here. And so what we do is the engine actually comes in and says, well, we're going to classify these different outcomes by how much we like them. And we don't like the ball going out. So we say, well, we're going to reduce that generously by a factor of 10. Um, so make it very unlikely the ball is going to go out. Um, we're going to increase the probability of the receive because that's a desirable thing. Maybe the player is inexperienced, we're going to give that player an extra bonus because that player has, does not have a lot of game experience. And we're going to increase the other thing too. And you know, after renormalization, that looks pretty okay. 70% for the intercept, that makes a good game. So that, by the way, happens at the game engine level. So the, the quantum <coughs> engine does all the physics and then tells the game engine what the choices are, and the game engine does all the power-ups and all the, all the math with the handicaps. So let me give you one more technical detail of the engine, though. Um, part of, this, of the idea of the system is it's very fast. To have a physical sport, things have to happen right on the spot. And the math I just showed you a second ago assumes that you've seen the, all the outcomes and you're choosing in hindsight, and that doesn't make it for a particularly good game. So we need to make some modifications to make this whole thing happen, you know, right on the spot. So, interestingly, we don't have to do anything at the beginning, but the moment the, the, all the bar particles reach the first player that could receive the ball, that's the moment we have to make a decision because that's the event that produces auditory feedback, potentially. So the way we do it is we're not just creating particles, we create something called probe lines. Probe lines are the complete trajectory of each ball particle, and then we do nothing for a moment because we can't produce auditory feedback, so why should we do anything? But the moment that the player 16 is actually, again, has the possibility to reach possession here, now we need to make a decision. And what we do is we compute player 16 because we know everything about it, but we don't know very much about, about the potential future, and that's where the probe lines come in. So we compute the intersection of the probe lines with the potential future, and then that gives us an estimate. Now, the player uh, 18 could still move around and change things, but probably not too much. And so we can pre-compute an estimate of how good the future is, and we can consider this when we make the decision between these two. There's still random involved, but based on the probabilities that we have. So let's imagine we assume that uh, we decide the engine decides that the ball go through. Now the particles reach player 18. The problem says everything else we have after this is just going to go out. So it's a very high probability at this point that the engine will decide to have, have let, uh, let player 18 have the ball. The whole thing happens under the hood. From the player's perspective, there is a single ball. All right, so here are a couple of the qualities of the resulting system. Number one is just 18, 9, 18, 9, 16. All right, so first of all, the fact that we have so much choice makes, it allows us to make really good gameplay. At any time, the engine knows about all the possible outcome, and the fact that it can choose allows the engine to produce, to stage a very good game. 
Number two, hmm, we call this the Schrodinger uh, you know, characteristic here. It means we don't have to make any decisions until they become visible, right? So if I throw a ball, until we produce auditory feedback, all the possibilities exist at the same time. That has interesting properties. For example, when player 18 keeps running around or like starts receiving the ball, it doesn't just increase the chance of him successfully catching the ball, it also, also increases the chance of the ball going to him. So we have the chance of influence in the game in hindsight, which is a very strange property of this game. Number three, the game is very forgiving. So because we have um, you know, all these uh, abilities to apply handicaps and so, and since everyone catches a few particles, we can actually have very inexperienced players play. But despite all the tweaking, at the end of the day, it's a game of skill. Because we never really set any, anything. All we do is we update and increase some of the things that are happening. So players have to be at the right time, at the right place. Read body language of other players, very similar to the skills that we need to play physical sports. And finally, it's easy to learn because we're emulating so much of the physical reality so um, that players who are experienced playing basketball can leverage all of this when they play quantum. Sorry, it's not called imaginary reality ball. We call it quantum ball internally for a while. Is that true? So we conducted a study with 30 participants. All of them were students, so we don't claim to standardize to anyone outside the lab. Um, they played three on three for about 20 minutes each. Um, more details in the paper, they rated it highly enjoyable, they thought it was a good balance between random and skill as we would have a physical sport. One said we had team spirit and wanted to beat the other game, so we feel like we observed some of the desirable qualities that we would expect from a physical sport. So to conclude, at this point, Imagine Reality games are a platform. I showed Imagine Reality basketball, we implemented a handful of games, there's more that could be done, and at this point it's mostly a question of game design. Um, but if I zoom back a little bit, the question where we actually got into this question was because we were investigating imaginary, imaginary interfaces, and we were wondering if they can actually, if we can create an illusion or an imagination that would hold across multiple people. And I think that this kind of game version is a pretty good indication that it is indeed possible for people to learn a screenless spatial interaction that goes across multiple people. So it's not just that we can create a reality and refer to it as ourselves, we can have some sort of a shared uh, imagination. Now as a next step, we have to see if we can take this back into the space 